Hey guys, what's up? It's Biscabool Horror Reviews. I'm here with my annual update of my top whatever most disturbing movies list. This year I have updated it from 15. I, I mean, last year I went up from 10 to 15. This year I'm going up from 15 to 20. Um, next year I might do 25. I don't know. Let's see how this pans out. Essentially this is uh, 20 of uh, the most disturbing movies I've ever seen. Um, and my personal opinion. Um... I, uh, really don't got much else to say other than that. I'm going to try and keep the speaking segments, uh, short. I know I say that in every single one of these videos, and then I end up talking for, like, ten minutes per movie. But this time, I'm going to try to really buckle down and focus on it, because I've got 20 movies to talk about. So, without further ado, let's just dive right in to number 20. And starting at the number 20 spot, we have a film from Japanese cult filmmaker Shion Sono, most well known for his 2001 horror mystery dark comedy film, Suicide Club, which is a very great film. Uh, I remember him most for his four hour long comedy drama film, Love Exposure, which is widely considered to be one of his best works. I'm talking, of course, about his um, serial killer film, Cold Fish. God damn. Coldfish is a film that's based on a true story, essentially about a serial killer in Japan who runs a fish shop and who makes kind of a partnership with a fellow uh, fish shop owner who he happens to run into. And this serial killer, he offers um, the the poorer the poorer fish shop owner the main character he offers that the main character um you know got kind of a deal between their two stores and he offers his daughter a job and everything and this guy is just being nice and nice and nice to the main character and then the main character finds out that this fish shop owner who he has befriended and made a business deal with and everything is actually a serial killer and um he kills and butchers people and hides the bodies in an almost perfect manner. Uh, things get heavy and depressing along the way. This movie runs for two and a half hours, and never before has there been a scene in a movie where a character is being told he's going to make millions of dollars, and it's depressing. Yet, this movie does it, and does it correctly somehow. The main character is very sympathetic and relatable, you don't want bad things to happen to him, and he doesn't want anything bad to happen to him. But he gets mixed up with a serial killer, and things end up going south for him. Um, it's a very violent movie, very, very depressing and dark in tone. Honestly, it is a damn good horror crime thriller. And uh, one I would highly recommend, especially if you're a fan of Shion Sono, if you really like his work already, this is definitely one to give a watch. Um, but yeah, that's uh, number 20 is Coldfish from Shion Sono. Next we, up next, we have the Michael Haneke film, Funny Games. Funny Games is a film Michael Haneke made in, I think he made it in 97. Um, it is essentially a film about this family, uh, mother, father, and young son, going to the vacation home, and they find these two juvenile delinquents at the house, and at first they seem to be pretty nice boys, but then the dog ends up dead, and they end up tied to chairs, and yeah, some shit happens. This is a home invasion film um, that features almost, you know, no explicit on-screen violence. And the purpose of the film is to not glorify violence and instead turn the viewer, make the viewer look away from the no violence that is happening on screen. It is um, essentially a very rough and uh, semi-satirical um almost self-aware film criticizing violence in films. It's it, criticizing violent horror films while also being a very uncomfortable, unnerving uh, home invasion horror film 
and if there's one thing that you might know about me from my channel is that home invasion horror films tend to get under my skin quite a bit because they, more often than not, they tend to be pretty realistic and, uh, just, you know, very claustrophobic movies, I guess, is the term I am looking for here. But, yeah, I think that's I think that's actually all I've got to say about funny games. It's been on my list for a few years now. It's moved around a bit, but it's still on the list. Let's get to the next one. Up next on the list, we have another psychological crime thriller horror home invasion film. The Austrian film Angst from a director who only did this one film, and it's kind of a shame because Angst is a legit masterpiece. Angst is essentially a film about a murderer, or attempted murderer, I guess, psychopath, who gets released from prison after being in prison for most of his adult life, and he, as soon as he gets released, he's trying to adjust to living in this town that he's lived in his pretty much his whole adult life, but he doesn't know anything about because he's been in prison the whole time. And it's a very uncomfortable film with not too much dialogue. There's uh, the film is told pretty much through inner monologue from the killer himself. Um, it's a very personal, close-up, uncomfortable look into the mind of uh, a serial killer, essentially. And uh, it's one of those movies that is just a really well put together thriller. The camera work is very up close and claustroph claustrophobic. The music is very, very, very just oh my god. The music is killer. Let's let's say the music's killer. All right. Um, the performances are very good all around, and it's just a very uncomfortable uh, film that makes you feel a bit. Uh, uneasy going home at night when the house is going to be empty. Uh, let me just leave it at that. Up next we have the found footage horror film which was featured on my list of uh, overlooked disturbing movies last year that I made. I'm of course talking about the found footage film Undocumented. Undocumented is a really depressing, honestly, like, just hard-hitting film. Um, it's essentially about these college students who are doing a documentary um, on illegal immigration, and they follow a bunch of immigrants as they are immigrating to the U.S., and they are caught by a group of right-wing extremists, and these extremists force the film crew to essentially film their horrific activities, which involve torturing illegal aliens to death, and um, etc., etc. It's a very uncomfortable film, despite being a bit over-the-top at times and a little cheesy at times. Um, the fact that it's found footage, I do, I will say, drags it down a bit, but the film still feels semi-real for the most part. Uh, there's a point in the film which is one of the most just gut-wrenching, like, soul-crushing moments where a man is being given the uh, immigration test, which has been proven time and time again that even natives to the U.S. cannot pass this test because it's just, you just have to learn the country's history. He's being given this test, and this particular person doesn't speak English, and he's being asked these questions in English, and every time he gets one wrong, his wife is progressively tortured more and more. This part of the film is easily just one of the most upsetting. Um, it's a really depressing hard-hitting, I know I've said all these things before, it's just a rough little film, and, you know, despite some of the technical shortcomings, despite it being a little over the top at times, it's still just not a pleasant film 
at all. I remember watching it completely on a whim and thinking, you know, maybe this will be worth, you know, my time. And coming out of the film completely shocked and just surprised by how much this film moved and upset me. And that's something not a lot of films can do. Up next is the Gaspar Noé film, I Stand Alone. This film, often called the uh, French Taxi Driver, is a film about a butcher who is um, essentially after uh, almost killing a man um, through a misunderstanding, he ends up get it going to prison and he gets out and he tries to get his life back together. He remarries, he gets his wife pregnant after losing, you know, everything he had after going to prison. He lost his butcher shop and everything. And while all this is happening, he's noticing the social decline of the country around him, as well as, and he's also trying to essentially reconnect with his estranged daughter, who he only knew for a short time, and uh, and hasn't seen in over ten years. Uh, this film uh, features a lot of inner monologue and a few rough scenes of violence, but for the most part, this is a very deep-seated psychological film. And it's the only film from Gaspar Noé that I've seen that I actually quite liked from him. I didn't really enjoy Enter the Void that much, and Irreversible I found to be very, very annoying. But this film was the right balance of dark content and violence with psychological kind of dread and torment. It's a little bit of a slow burn kind of film, but it's very much worth a watch. The performances are all very good. And, like I said before, this film is essentially the French taxi driver, and I stand by that comparison most definitely. It has that very lonely, um, isolation kind of, isolated kind of feeling to it, and it's just not one to, uh, watch when you're looking for a movie to watch on a rainy afternoon, I'll tell you that much. Up next, we got the British TV movie Threads. This is a m another one that's been featured on my lists many, many times. I think it's been a recurring title on the list for at least two years now, and for good reason. I recently rewatched Threads uh, after getting the recent Blu ray release of it from Severn Films, which was a fantastic release, mind you. And. Threads is still as depressing, graphic, and upsetting as a film could be, and it's a British TV movie. Usually when you hear the term, or when I at least hear the term, TV movie in regards to a movie being violent or disturbing, or it being a horror movie in general, I usually take it with a grain of salt. Because, considering it's a TV film, I just kind of don't want to see it because they can't do as much because it's a TV film. Especially in Britain where the censorship, where censorship laws are f fucking heavy when it comes to movies. But surprisingly this documentary, this semi-documentary drama film, um, I think it's about Itinfield, England. I could be wrong. I'm probably wrong. But it's essentially about a town in England that um, is hit not dead on, but is but England is bombed, and the people in the town, whoever the, those who don't die, end up trying to survive. And this film essentially just shows the negative effects of what would happen um, if there was a bombing, and it is widely considered to be one of the most accurate portrayals of a nuclear winter ever put on any form of media. I will say, after rewatching it, there are a couple moments that are that feel a little bit um, over the top, like uh, people 
selling dead rats that they found in ruins as food. But at the same time, in a situation like that, it seems like something that could be very plausible, despite being a little, uh, despite feeling like, feeling and sounding like something that, that, that's come right out of Fallout. Um, it's just a rough, I mean, I'm gonna keep saying the, using the same adjectives over and over again, but for a British TV movie, this is easily one of the just most unnerving and uncomfortable things I've ever seen. Hence its place on the list. And while it isn't super, you know, high on the list, um, it's still a very, very uncomfortable experience and one I would highly recommend to just about anybody, honestly. Up next, we have the Harmony Korine film from 1997, Gummo. Gummo is um, a fucking pretentious John Waters film. It's essentially a gross, dark comedy about a town in uh, about Xenia, Ohio. After being hit with a tornado, the town has never really recovered, and it's essentially a semi, kind of almost documentary film, drama, dark comedy about the people that live in the town attempting to find happiness in their situ in their everyday situations when there is none to be found. A film essentially about why life is completely meaningless. Gummo is a surprisingly funny movie despite being disgusting and disturbing and very, very down note. Um, it's equally one of the most, like, psychologically unnerving. It, it, it's, it's equally, like, a, one of the most depressing and one of the most hilarious movies I've ever seen. And it shows real skill from Harmony Korine as a director um, writing and producing this film. A lot of people like to, you know, shit on this film and say it's boring, and I can see where people are coming from with that uh, criticism of the film, but at the end of the day... It's, I believe, an immensely captivating, albeit fucked up and upsetting and uh, disturbing movie uh, about poor white trash. It's essentially poor white trash, the movie. Up next, we have the Oshimanagisa film, In the Realm of the Senses. In the Realm of the Senses is a, is a film about the story of um, Sade Ab, who is a Japanese woman who was a geisha, who started to have an affair with um, the owner of the inn she eventually got a job at after leaving her life as a geisha. And her and the owner of the inn start to get into a bit of an affair, a bit of a weird relationship. And things go south pretty quickly uh, with an ending that is fairly famous. And if you know the true story of Sade Abe or Sade Ab, um, then you know what happens. But I'm going to leave that uh, out of this because I don't want to spoil anything. Essentially, what we have here is a film that is an immensely ex sexually explicit, but still very, very just a um, very good um, art film is what we have here. A film about sexual obsession and arguably one of the greatest films about sexual obsession and um, you know one of the greatest films about sexual obsession of all time and easily just one of those movies that despite being old, despite being as old as it is, um is still very uncomfortable uh, to watch. I don't know where else to go with this. Uh, all I'm gonna say uh, about In the Realm of the Senses now is it's uncomfortable and not a very pleasant film to watch but a very interesting one and one of my favorite Japanese films, uh, without a doubt. Up next, we have the Lucifer Valentine film. 
black metal veins. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of Lewis for Valentine. I kind of like Regurgitated Sacrifice a little bit. But as for his most famous works being the Vomit Gore films, they aren't my cup of tea. That being said, his documentary, although it has uh, somewhat recently come out that it is actually completely staged, which is kind of fucked up, but I think that that kind of makes me almost respect Louis for Valentine more as a filmmaker, because the film felt very real. Uh... I'm talking about his film Black Metal Veins, which is essentially a film uh, about a uh, fake documentary, simulated documentary, I guess, mockumentary, if you want to go that far with it, but it's not, um, not really meant to, ah, uh, whatever, I'm not even gonna fucking try anymore. Um, a film about a group of heroin addicts who are also in a black metal band, uh, that Valentine himself friend that Valentine himself uh, befriended while online and essentially he documents their day-to-day -day life um, of shooting up and performing and living in a really really dirty apartment it's a very upsetting uh, uncomfortable film especially as somebody who is, has been personally affected by addiction uh, many people in my family suffer from addiction and it's absolutely just awful um, to see it firsthand. And this film is definitely as close as you could get to seeing it firsthand yourself. Uh, there's a point in the film where somebody overdoses and dies. Now that I know that the film is fake, it's not as uh, it's it's not as heart it's not as heartbreaking, but it's still very very upsetting. Honestly, I've heard, um, too, I've heard recently, too, that Louis for Valentine's next project is going to be, um, a semi-documentary film. It might be more documentary-based, which I'm more than willing to check that out if it's anything like Black Metal Veins. Black Metal Veins is a very, very, uh, fucked movie as a whole. It's, 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 it's fucked. That's... That's all I have to say about Black Metal Veins. Let's get on to the next one. This is this is getting harder and harder to do, honestly. Up next, we got the one film that everybody puts on their disturbing movies list, and that I put on the list mainly because, yeah, while it is definitely upsetting and disturbing, it's still not anything super amazing, or, in my opinion, that disturbing hence it's placing on this list i'm talking about a serbian film i'm gonna try and keep this one short uh, a serbian film is <laughs> dogs man a serbian film is a uh a, a serbian horror film from a few years back uh, i think it's been like seven or eight years since its release and the film is about a aging porn star who is getting low on funds. So in order to support his family, he goes back to the porn business and signs up to be in a art film uh, that's being produced by this shady director. And things start out all right, but then suddenly there's little kids on the set of the film. And once the main character... Uh, I can't even remember the name of the main... I know what it is, uh, Mios, Milos, Mi fuck it. As soon as the main character, uh, wants out, he realizes he is in too deep, and then there's a, a scene of baby rape in the movie, and, um, yeah, uh, again, while it's an immensely, uh, upsetting, uncomfortable, disturbing, fucked up, violent film, it's a film I still really wouldn't say is the most disturbing movie ever. There have been movies that have hit me harder and left me, and left more of an impact on me. While I do definitely think a Serbian film is an interesting kind of, is an interesting kind of, uh, social commentary on the Serbian government, there's another Serbian horror film, which is also featured on the list, which is also going to be featured on this list, that I've also, 
um, talked about quite a bit that I think does a better job of being um, uncomfortable and unnerving and disturbing uh, without relying on baby rape and shit like that. As And it also has pretty much the same messages as a Serbian film, again, without relying on things like newborn porn. Let's just get to the next fucking thing on this list. Up next, we have a animated film from Japan from 1992. I'm talking about Midoriya, also known as Shoujo Subaki. This is a 40-minute long anime film from Japan from the 90s that I mentioned on my um, I mentioned in my semi-recent video about overlooked disturbing movies because uh, I don't hear this one mentioned too often. And let me say, this movie is easily the most fucked up animated film I've ever seen. It's essentially about a young girl who is, um, I believe she's orphaned, or she runs away from home. Either way, she joins this traveling freak show circus, and in order to keep a roof over her head, and in order to earn her, um, earn, a, you know, her meals and everything, she has to cook and clean and do all kinds of manual labor for them, as well as allow these freaks and deformed people to rape her, um, this young, like, 14-year-old girl. This is a very fucked up, uncomfortable movie, to the point that when the freaks, the freaks are so dedicated to, uh, ruining this girl's life and making her, uh, miserable, to the point that when they find out she is, she has found some kind of happiness, um, with visiting these, uh, dogs uh, every day when she's walking home from I think it's from school or whatever I can I it's been a it's been like a year since I watched this and I really don't want to rewatch it because it is very uncomfortable but when they find out that she has some little bit of happiness by visiting these dogs every day they go and stomp these little puppies to death and then cook them in a stew and make her eat it for dinner that night uh Amputee sex, pedophilia, rape, murder, mutilation, and there's even a dwarf magician thrown in there for good measure. This movie is f just a hundred different shades of fucked, and it's a movie that, while very uh, unpleasant and uncomfortable, I do, um, I, 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 I did kind of find it very captivating because I wanted to see how far it could go and yeah I mean it's it's above a Serbian film on this list so that should say something about it up next on the list we have a I think it's a Chinese exploitation horror film uh, the men behind the sun the Men Behind the Sun is a film about the Japanese Unit 731, which was a unit of the Japanese military during World War II um, that performed medical experiments on innocent Chinese prisoners of war during World War II. Um, this incident was pretty much covered up after, uh, the, after the Japanese lost World War II, and they killed everybody in the facility, and everybody fled, and changed identities, and there are people who deny that this, as well as the uh, rib from Nanking, happened to this day. Do I even need to explain why this is a disturbing movie? Why this is this high up on the list? It's about performing medical experiments on innocent people for no reason other than the pure hatred of said people. Um... I don't think I have to say much else. It's it's an idea that is disgusting and disturbing, I would think, to most human beings, and especially to me, because on a list of things that are like, you know, absolute nightmare fuel for me, um, something like this or, uh, for instance, the events of Johnny Got His Gun are two of the things that are very high up on the list for me because they're things that I... I I I have nightmares about these fucking things. They're they 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 fucking they mess with me so much. Um, but yeah, that being said, this spot goes to the men behind the sun. Up 
next on the list, we have a Serbian dark comedy horror found footage exploitation film, The Life and Death of a Porno Gang. On top of this being one of my favorite movies of all time, it's one of my favorite dark comedies and one of my favorite disturbing movies. On top of all that, it's also a very disturbing movie on its own. Essentially, it is a film about a traveling porno cabaret theater who... They start out doing just one show, and then the police come in and shut them down, and the guy who decides to start this show, who is the main character of the film, um, he owes a porn producer money, and the porn producer is starting to kill him, so him and all the members of this porno cabaret, they decide to go travel around to small towns in Serbia, and essentially put on a show for, you know, everybody to uh, and have some fun with. This backfires on them when one of the towns uh, doesn't appreciate them being there, and it results in everybody in the group getting raped in a massive uh, gang rape scene that ends with a very dark joke that is actually pretty, pretty, pretty fucking good. Um, eventually, after going through all, all this stuff, after being, you know, harassed by villagers, the police, the government, they eventually start making snuff films um, with the help of a previous snuff filmmaker who they happen to run into and as soon as they start making snuff films things get more and more complicated and dark in this film until everything comes to a head. This movie has a, the very, a very similar kind of message to it that a Serbian film does. Um, essentially with the film being about how the Serbian government mistreats not just immigrants but citizens on a daily basis there. Uh, that's what this film is about and that's what a Serbian film is about, but this film gets its point across while simultaneously disturbing you and making you laugh without resorting to something like baby rape to get it across. I hate to compare the two films, a Serbian film and the Life and Death of Porto Gang too much, so I'm just gonna leave it there. Up next, we have the Spanish horror thriller psychological um, drama film In a Glass Cage. This film is something, let me tell you. It is a film about a former Nazi hiding out, and uh, after he believes he is discovered, and while continuing to do some very Nazi ish activities, um, he attempts suicide. And. After failing that, he ends up in an iron lung and he cannot breathe for himself. All of this is, well, tragic in his sake. Um, I wouldn't say it's, it's tragic for the viewer because he's a Nazi, he deserves it. But after all this happens to him, he gets a new male nurse. This male nurse is a rather handsome young man who seems very familiar to the main character. I don't want to go into too much detail about what this film is, is about and these characters' relationships or anything like that, because it's a really dark, fucked-up movie, and it's also just a really well-done horror thriller um, that if I explain one of the big reasons why, it will ruin the, 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 the reveal of it itself, I think. Um... Let me just say that the main character, specifically when he was uh, involved in the Holocaust, he was in charge of killing children, specifically. And I'm going to leave it there. Uh, yeah, it's a weird, not weird, but crazy, dark, emotionally distressing revenge film, essentially. Up next, we have one of the regulars on the list. I'm talking about Orozco the Embalmer. I'm not going to try to dwell on this one too much because I've talked so much about it in these videos, so I'm just going to get straight into it. Orozco the Embalmer is a film from a Japanese death photographer who is still working in death photography and filmmaking to this day. Um, but this is one of his earliest films, and this is definitely his best film so far. 
It is essentially a documentary that he shot, I think, in the late 90s, while in a very poor neighborhood in Colombia, and he is documenting Orozco, who is a local embalmer who works pretty much out of his garage. And while working out of his garage, he ends up embalming many, many corpses. All of this footage is very real, it's very up close, it's very personal, and on top of it being real, it's done in a very cheap, poor country. It's done in a very poor country on a budget, in a garage, for fuck's sake. It's easily one of the goriest films ever made, and... I mean, the film pretty much opens up with a dead body lying in the street and people just kind of walking by it as if this is normal, which in that neighborhood, it, in, or particularly, it is. Uh, it's a sick and disgusting, heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching film about how fragile life is. And uh, I think that's it. Up next on the list, we have Pierre Pasolini's Salo, or The 120 Days of Sodom. Now, this film has never actually been featured on any of my Disturbing Movies videos or lists before, mainly because I watched it when I was in high school and I really wasn't that shocked or unnerved or affected by it. It's very similar to the first time I watched a Serbian film. When I first watched a Serbian film, I finished it and I was like, yeah, I mean, that was a pretty good movie, but what's everybody freaking out about? It wasn't until I re-watched a Serbian film that it truly hit me. And very similar to a Serbian film, this film I bought on Blu-ray because I figured, you know, you gotta have it in any fucked up movie collection. And I figure, yeah, let's 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 rewatch this. I haven't watched it since high school. Maybe I'll like it more. And after rewatching it, I, as I was rewatching it, I was hit with this tidal wave of disgust and dread and sadness, the likes of which I hadn't felt in a long, long time. It's not since I you know, last watched, like, Goodbye Uncle Tom, or Cannibal Holocaust, it, it's, it was a very, it was very fucking heavy, mind you, and that's kind of why I wanted to feature it this high up on the list, because holy shit, does re-watching this film as an adult and really paying attention to it really fuck with you on more than just a, oh, eating shit, or oh, torture level. It's a very psychologically disturbing film, um, and you gotta think about what the characters are going through here, you know? There's there's the famous scene in the beginning where they're expecting, where they're inspecting, like, all the, the, the teenagers that they've kidnapped, and you gotta think about this, like, these people, these, these teenagers being held at gunpoint, forced to expose themselves to a bunch of rich people, or else be killed. That's fucking heavy. And, uh, yeah. Um, do I even need to say what Salo is about? I'll go through it real quick. Um, essentially it's an adaptation of the, of the story by the Marquis de Sade. Uh, Salo is the story of a, of a group of teenagers who are kidnapped, uh, during war, during times of war in Italy, by noblemen, and they are forced to essentially, you know, conform to this, to their new lives as, as, as sex slaves or die. And it gets really, really fucked up with things like shitting and other things like that involved. Um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's basically sallow. On to the next one. Up next, we have another regular on the list. This one is Titicut Follies, the infamous uh, documentary film shot in mental institutions in the 1960s, essentially showing the living conditions of the mentally ill in the 60s, and also showing the orderlies abusing the patients, as well as 
people who are very obviously not uh, insane of being locked up in asylums for being gay or communist, etc., etc. Um, it's a very upsetting and very disturbing film from many aspects, but mainly because, you know, innocent people were affected because of this, and people who were just, who were suffering, legitimately suffering, um, were sent to these places to suffer even more. They weren't sent there to get better. They were sent there to essentially just be treated even worse than they were in the outside world. Um, it's all very, it's a, it's, it's a, it's all real. All the footage is legit. And the film is actually kind of banned in America. Um, due, kind of, sort of, due to the fact that it violates the HIPAA laws of doctor-patient confidentiality. Although everybody who was featured in the film is most likely dead at this point. Uh, I don't know why Criterion hasn't come to release this or anything. But I'm hoping that there'll be a nice release of Titicut Follies one day. But as is, we have it on the internet now. So, I guess there's that. And yeah, the spot, it is Titicut Follies. Up next, we have another regular on the list. Ruggiero Deodato's Cannibal Holocaust. This one has been featured on my list since pretty much the fucking beginning. And the more I go back and watch this film, the more I just feel sickened by it because while the film is very interesting and engaging and it's a legitimately great piece of exploitation cinema it has a point to it um the point being to sympathize with native tribes who were being mistreated and um essentially facing genocide because people believe that they are savages the problem with Cannibal Holocaust is that it tries to have this message while also showing the natives as savages who killed this film crew. So it's it's kind of counterintuitive in a way, as well as showing them killing other tribesmen and some other stuff. For those of you who don't know about Cannibal Holocaust, one of the most famous Italian horror films, one of the most pro widely considered to be the best Italian cannibal film, Essentially, the first found footage film ever made uh, about a documentary film crew who goes down to the Amazon rainforest to do a documentary about cannibalism, and when they don't come back, a uh, professor goes down after them to see what the hell happened, and he finds their footage and their corpses, and essentially, after that, they watch the footage and find out that the film crew wasn't... Um, the nicest to the locals, shall we say. Um, yeah, so on top of all of these, you know, themes about civilization and, you know, savagery and cannibalism, there's also actual animal killings in this movie, to top it off. So that's another thing. Um, do I even really need to talk about Cannibal Holocaust that much anymore? <laughs> Another, yet another, regular on the list, still holding its spot at second place, we have Come and See, the 80s drama anti-war film uh, from Russia. This film is about a young boy who essentially joins the Soviet army during World War II, and in, a, in an attempt to... Uh, help protect his country and things go south when he is captured by Nazis and witnesses an entire town of innocent people being burned to the ground as well as some other shit this is one of the most depressing hard hitting anti-war films out there up there with the likes of Johnny Got His Gun probably d definitely worse than Johnny Got His Gun Come and See is a movie I've only seen twice and I don't think I want to see it ever again Mainly because it, it, it's just fucked. It's, it's a film about war and atrocities seen through the eyes of a child, essentially. Um, do I, do I need to go on? I, I've talked about this enough on my channel. Uh, the, the, uh. 
and at the number one spot still absolutely reigning supreme is goodbye uncle tom god what can i say about goodbye uncle tom it was a film made by mondo filmmakers um as a essentially a reply to criticisms uh given to them about their film africa dito um criticisms that they faced claiming that the directors of the film were racist and to combat these claims they figured they'd make a, a film pretty much entirely about human suffering and slavery so they shot a documentary drama um about some documentary filmmakers who go back in time somehow yeah it's a little ridiculous but stay with me. They go back in time somehow and they essentially witness slavery in the U.S. happen in real time. And nothing in this film is exaggerated or, like, you know, necessarily, I don't want to say fake, false is probably the term to use. Because there are actual documents from the time that support the uh, atrocities committed in this film as actual events. I don't, I'm at a loss for words. It's, Goodbye Uncle Tom is one of the most depressing, definitely one of the most disturbing movies I've ever seen. One of the most depressing films that has ever been made. It's a film strictly about human suffering and hatred and racism. And are the filmmakers racist for making this movie? Probably. But the soundtrack to this film is very good. It's a very well shot and well made film despite its very, very, very uncomfortable subject matter. And... It's a film that I've seen like one and a half times I, I tried to watch it uh kind of recently and I had to turn it off about halfway through I was just not having it that day I was not um I was not feeling it and it's hard for films to make me feel that way but Africa not Africa Dito but Goodbye Uncle Tom does if you want to see a film about true human suffering and mankind's natural hatred for its own species, Goodbye Uncle Tom is the film to see. With that being said, this is the top 20 most disturbing movies list. This is probably going to be the last one I'm going to do for a few years, mainly because shooting this year's video just wasn't... Like, the, the list really hasn't grown much, the titles haven't changed much, and recording this video and making this and editing this just wasn't as fun this time around um, as it was, as it has been previous years. So I'm going to take a break from this um, for at least a year or two. And maybe I'll come back to it one day, maybe I won't. But as is, this is the current update of my list of the top 20 most disturbing movies in my personal opinion. Anyway guys, this is Biscuit Bill Horror Reviews, signing off. Peace.